Good afternoon, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, Samson, can you make it a full screen, the slide? Thank you. So for today's uh, talk, I just want a broader uh, perspective to set our minds as to why even we are talking about Urwan and Pravashi. As all of us know that we are in this physical world and at some point we all need to get to the next shore, which is the spiritual world and cross this allegorical bridge, the Chinwat pool. So we need to understand what is the purpose of our life? What, what are we really supposed to do once we are born? And if we review our scriptures, we have a twofold obligation or goals that we want to achieve. One is to achieve our individual salvation by perfecting our soul. And another broader purpose of life is after having achieved perfection of our soul, we help other souls to obtain their collective salvation. And those terms are called the eventual prashokarity and the ristakesh in our religion. So having that background in our mind, now let us examine what is Urwan and what is Pravashi. Next slide. In our scriptures, there is a belief that there is a future life. It's very prominent in both Avesta as well as the Palvi scriptures. In the Gathas, there is an allusion to it, but then the later texts build on that. The doctrine of immortality of soul was first propounded by our prophet Zarathustra. Before that, the concept of soul was not very clear. And then also behind that, there is a concept of freedom of choice, which also interacts in the uh, way the roles of the Urwan and the Pravashi uh, work with each other. And of course, there's always an expectation that the world will be restored to perfection at some future time. So let's understand this complex composition of ourselves. In the Avesta, we are told that we are composed of nine different aspects. Three of them are physical, three are ethereal, and the other three are spiritual. And this, this illustration tells us that each aspect also has three different phases. One is the, in the center is the present form. And then on the left is the awakening and the right on the right is the eternal aspect. So anyhow, let's go into the details of these nine different terminologies. We find these nine Avesta terms in Yasna 55. The three physical are very obvious. Tanu, meaning the physical body. The Asdi or the Asdebish is the skeleton. And Gaita is the fleshy part on the skeleton. Then the next three are ethereal. Ethereal meaning they're a little hard to conceptualize, but they, they have their own functions. And we won't go into all the details because there won't be enough time for that. 
The three ethereal ones are care, which is our aura or halo that we see in the pictures. Ustana means the vital life force. And Tevishi is the emotions and the feelings part of it. And then we come to the final three spiritual components, which is the Urwan, which is the soul, for lack of anything else. Bahodang, which is our conscience. And Pravashi, which is the divine spark of God. And today we'll restrict our talk to the discussion of how the Urwan is supposed to function in this life and what are the roles of Pravashi in helping us. So as I said, Urwan is a very complicated term. It occurs about 15 times in the gathas. And by critically examining these references, we are able to define what it is and how it should function. And like I said, the only way we can describe Urwan is to call it the soul. The Avesta term Urwan comes from the root war, means to choose. So Urwan is the chooser. It's the discriminator. It selects the good from the bad, what is right from wrong, etc. The Pahlavi equivalent is called Ravan. And in modern Persia, I mean Ruwan, and in modern Persian. It's called the Ravan. So Urwan is a spiritual faculty of our personality. It discriminates and chooses what is good, what is evil. But the important thing is that it is immortal. It doesn't die with the bodily death. And our religion teaches us that the Urwan or us, basically, we would be held responsible for all our actions committed during life in this physical world. And those will result in the experience and consequences in the future spiritual life. So to sum up really, we don't have a soul. We are the soul. We are the soul. Avesta gives us a wonderful account of the nature of Urwan, also in our Parvardinyas, in Hadokyas, in Vandidad and in the Bunda Hishna text. All of those have wonderful details on how the Urwan should function. The spiritual essence is eternal. And we were told that originally it was in dormant state and it evolved by the impulse of Spentamainu within its nature. When we are living in this physical world, the Geti, we are told that our soul, we, our soul again, can attain full spiritual consciousness by choosing good over evil, right over wrong, and that will lead to bring about the ultimate renovation, which is called Prasho Kariti, meaning to make fresh. And another detail that we find in our scriptures is that we are not just born into this world without any kind of um, help. 
Our Urwan is equipped with the guiding spirit, the Pravashi, which is the divinity in men. And it's also accompanied by so many different faculties that are there to enable us to succeed in our mission. Some of those terms are kratu, which means energy or knowledge. Chisti means consideration, wisdom. Ushi is the intelligence or sense. We call it hosh. Manas, our mind, the thought process. Vachas means we are equipped with speech. Vasa, very important, or kama, free will. Dayana, Dayana is also an, a part of conscience, which animated conscience. Ahu, which is the practical conscience, and Bodhas, which is the ultimate consciousness. So with all these faculties, the Urwan is well equipped to sort of fulfill its mission. Now let's switch to Pravashi. So we said Pravashi is the divine spark of God within us. Pra means something forward that promotes forward motion. And Vasi means to evolve. So by the very translation, Pravashi is an element that will help our soul to move forward in its mission and to evolve. Now, very simply, what we know is that we have a part of God within us. We have a spark of God, a part of God, whatever we want to call it, that is put within us to guide our soul, to guide us, to make the right choice in every single thought, every single word, or every single action that we initiate. Also, we are told that Aura Mazda reserves his contact with each of his creations through the Fravashi that is within each object. That means whether it's an animal kingdom, plant kingdom, or any creation of our Mazda will have a Pravashi. And through that Pravashi, our Mazda sort of monitors his whole creation. He sustains, he maintains, and he advances every single object towards perfection with the help of its Pravashi. The function of the Pravashi is to guide the Urwan to choose the right path so that we stay on the right path to attain Kordad and Amardad, perfection and immortality. The function of the Pravashi is to defeat all the evil tendencies, thoughts, and render them important. In Avesta, Pravashi is referred to as Anamantavao. This means that it's a concept that cannot be conceived clearly by our human thought. It is so immense that it's hard to imagine what it is. It's called Uru Vinaiti, that means of last vision. Vaso Yauna, or extending in all directions without limit. And Durae Sukha, or of far illumined vision. So no wonder we will have a little hard time uh, getting a full grasp of what this element of Pravashi is. 
But the important thing to remember is that we have it and it is there with us to fully guide us in our life. However, since our Mazda has given mankind freedom of choice, to respect the freedom of choice, the Pravashi does not and cannot interfere with the free will of the Urwan. Urwan has to choose and be responsible for the choice. So it becomes a duty of our soul that the soul needs to ask the assistance of the Pravashi that is within us. Not only must the soul or the Urwan ask for the guidance, but the second step is it also needs to follow the advice of Pravashi. If the Urwan does not ask for help, then Pravashi will not interfere. We can go about our merry ways of doing whatever we want, use our free will, lead the way of life we want. And if we're going wrong, the Pravashi is not going to interfere. So that is very important. And the other important part is that not only do we have to ask the Pravashi for help, ask for what is the correct thing to do in a difficult situation or in any normal situation, but then to follow up with its guidance. Because the second step is also very important that having developed the habit of always invoking our Pravashi, we always have the choice that we don't necessarily want to follow it. And the Pravashi will not force us or will compel us to follow the advice. It will not tell us that, hey, why did you ask me advice? And now you're not following it. That is not its role. So this is very important to understand that Urwan has a choice. It can follow the advice or it can follow its own inclination. And this is why in spite of having element of God, in spite of having an element that has all the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong within us, we can end up in all kinds of trouble, sin, chaos, experience sorrow, pain, and grief. To progress and succeed, we need to develop a constant habit of invoking the help of Pravashi in every single thing that we do. If we constantly ask Pravashi for its guidance and we put that into our practice, our life will begin to change positively. So then the next question comes up is how do we develop this habit? If, if it's so important that we can attain our goal of our soul attaining perfection and immortality, then there must be a mechanism that our religion has provided us. And that mechanism is through our daily prayers. Not only reciting these prayers, but a sincere understanding of our prayers, we will automatically achieve the step of invoking our Pravashi, having awareness of Pravashi, and then that will lead us to our spiritual progress. So it's mentioned that we do not come across the word Pravashi in the Gathas. Yes, it's not mentioned in the Gathas as we know it, but it's mentioned in the Yasna Haptangaiti, Yasna 37.3 which is the closest in Gothic nature. And also in our Avesta prayers, in Hadokyas, 
the source of Ravashi is referred to be Spenta Mainyu and Vaishtamana, which is a good mind, which both occur in the Gathas. The concept of Ravashi is presented in Yasna 23, Yasna 26, and has been fully developed in the forward in Yas. In Pahlavi, the term for Fravashi is Farohar. The Farohar or the Fravashi is indivisible, just like God. But only to facilitate our mental concept, we use the plural word Fravashis. But in essence, it's one element, God, or our master. So the way it's portrayed in some of our scriptures is that Fravashi projects the light, Ushta, onto the Urwan. And to do that, it uses the agency of Bodhanga, which is consciousness. So because I'm an electrical engineer, Bodhanga X like a step-up transformer in the projection of the light. It focuses this light onto the soul. So Pravashi is the eternal spiritual aspect with no beginning, no bend, no end, because it is the element of God. Interesting to note that Urwan has been given a masculine tone in our scriptures, and Fravashi has been given a female uh, annotation. So we're told that she, the Fravashi, exists before the individual was born, and on our bodily death, it separates itself and returns to the spiritual world. We always honor and remember the collective Fravashis of all the holy souls. Her help is invoked through our prayers and rituals. Important thing to remember is that Fravashis blessings and help are esteemed as the most effectual help in our progress. Pravashis always afford us prosperity and success whenever we invoke it. Important part, we need to invoke our Pravashi. In order to understand the vast scope of the role of Pravashis, the forward in yes, places them into three different groups. Group one are the Fravashis that we talked about inherent in humans as well as all creations of God. The second group of Fravashis are the Fravashis that work on a spiritual plane and they come to aid when they come to aid on a physical plane only when they are invoked. And there is a third group of Pravashis of the Asho, of those who have lived a good life that come to the physical plane for a specific period of 10 days during the Hamaspat Medam Tambar time. And they come without any invocation. So that's the only time that the Fravashis come to help without any invocation. And we are told that they come in a spirit of joyfulness and that they expect genuine reverence from us, worship from us, paid to them, not just mere lip service, 
but the worship and service in terms of the good life that we live. Now there is a, in the background, there is an important concept that I want to cover, which is Sarosh. What, what is Sarosh? Sarosh is an attribute of our Mazda. It comes from the word sru, to listen. It means to the, so we already covered, that is our conscience that acts as the intermediary. But Sarosh is the conscience in a sense that it not only listens, it helps us listen, but it, it is a little bit more, meaning we listen and obey to the commandments of God or to the suggestions of Pravashi, which is the element of God. So it's important to have the concept of Sarosh in our mind. It's up to my soul to constantly seek advice and listen to that advice, listen to that voice of Sarosh, and then choose to follow it. So the willing obedience to listen and follow to the advice of the Pravashi is Sarosh. And that is why Sarosh is important in all our prayers. After doing our Kashti prayers, we are told that we cannot proceed without reciting the Sarosh Baj prayer. Why? Because it is through the Sarosh Baj prayer that we invoke and awaken our conscience. Otherwise it goes to sleep. We just kind of shove it aside in our daily life. And the importance of Sarosh is that he may protect us from our own evil mind and help us to do the right things in life. So in our prayers, Sarosh is described as Vispe Majistyam, 30, Yasna 33.5. And we have a line, Sarosh Asho Tagitan Parman Shekhaf Jin Jina Vajar Salare Damane Auramas the Beresa. So Asho means it's fulfilling the cosmic law of Asha. Tagi or Takmane means it's mighty. Tan Farman or Tanu Matre means it's the embodiment of God's teachings. Shekhaf Tajin Jina Vajar means it's the strength and support of all the moral force in our life. So, and it's described as Salare Damane Auramazda, meaning it is the commander in chief of Auramazda. It should be the supreme principle in my life. And the last two words, Darshi Roks, means it triumphs over forces of darkness wise, doubt, disbelief, etc. So now we talked about the role while we are alive. What happens when we pass away? We come to this world as souls from the spiritual world when we are born. A simple way to think is that we have a body, just like a coat, a jacket. We live this earthly life in this body. We take care of the body because it's gar guarding the important element of our Urvan and Pravashi in it. But when our body or the coat is worn out, it is to be removed and discarded. It has served its purpose. However, important to note that just because the body 
is grown old, worn out, discarded. We still remain the same person without our coat, without our body. When the body dies, our soul continues to live on. In our blatant ignorance of conditions of life beyond, we call this change death. It's really not death. We just have passed away. We feel the loss of a dear one who has passed away. It's natural. In ignorance, we bring about gloom and doom. We forget that we, our soul, was born into this world with a divine plan to lead this life, to evolve, and to pass on to the spiritual world. We forget that. So death that we fear is no, death, is no death at all. It's a necessary change, a transition from one form of life to another, from one condition, a physical condition, to a spiritual condition. It's part of nature's plan. The real us, we pass onward into the spiritual world, which is called the Minoi, to continue our journey to perfection. So we never die, we pass away, we do not die. So this is a little reflection that our life is similar to a long journey. Who knows that the, when the time of this transition will interrupt our journey? And shouldn't we plan for it? But do we? We are so lost in the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle, the excitement and sensation, that we become deaf to the divine calls that try to awaken us. Sometimes we don't even time for it. We conveniently forget that at some point we are going to pass away. And then what? We have not prepared for this long spiritual journey. So in that respect, we need to make a determination to let us shed away all the useless baggage of wants and desires. Let us collect only the real wealth of goodness that we can take with us. Dastruji Minoche Ramji used to drum it in our head that goodness is the only foreign exchange that we can take with us when we depart from this life. Everything else that we have uh, collected and worked for and uh, dedicated our lives to is useless because we have to leave it all behind us. So let us then start living a purposeful and meaningful life of charity and service to others and to learn how to lead such a life let us make an attempt to understand our daily prayers and their teachings. In Atashnyas, we pray three times. Man ana avayat sudan. Man ana avayat sudan. Man ana sudan. And what it means is, may I live without guilt here in this physical world because I have to go back there to the spiritual world. If we pray this with understanding, then we know what to do, how to live our life, etc. So mere muttering of prayers without understanding might indicate faith, but such muttering 
leaves the spiritual thirst of the soul unquenched. Let us mend this mode of life. Let us make a concerted effort to make sure that our old one invokes our pravashi and also follow the pravashi's advice in each and every actions that we take. With the proper guidance of our pravashi, our Urwan and we will make the proper choices and therefore lead a harmonious life in this material world, which will then result for us to enjoy perfect bliss and eternal peace in the spiritual world. So what we have done is we've traced the dual purpose of our life, gaining perfection and immortality for our soul, and also contributing towards fresh clarity. We have reviewed the composition of men with special reference to the doctrine of the soul, the concept of divine and eternal fravashi, and covered the concept of sarosh, Asso Zarsushtra's message of faith in our Mazda, the immortal Urwan and the eternal Pravashi, if restated, if understood, and if practiced in our life, has the power to inspire not only us, but the entire humanity to its goal of spiritual progress and everlasting bliss. Ashaonam Vanguhim Surao Spentao Pravashiyo, Stomi, Zabiemi, Ufiemi. In our prayers, we recite, I give praise, I remember and sing my songs of devotion to the kind, simple, and beneficent Pravashis of the Asho. So I hope this concludes my um, talk. I had these two slides on the uh, picture of Arohar, what it means. And we'll leave it, if it comes up in the discussion, we can cover it. But at this point, I would like to open it up for questions or comments. I hope I have done enough to uh, dwell and drill into your mind, the concepts of the Urwan and Prabhashi. Hey, Kaironas, thanks a lot for the excellent presentation. We still have some time. You can go through those last two slides if you'd like. You would okay. love to. You would love to hear that. Okay. Tempton, can you put those up, please? Sorry about that. It's all right. This this is when I um, heard that uh, we are going to talk about Kawashi. I uh, pulled out an old flyer that I used to use for my class. And it describes the symbol. So our symbol of Farohar, whenever somebody sees it as a pendant with some of our ladies or we wear on our coat lapel, then what is this? What does this signify? And so this is my explanation. And there are several other explanations that are available. So it's by no means the only correct explanation. But this is how I have developed what it refers to. So to me, the symbol of Farohar represents the entire Zoroastrian philosophy in a nutshell. In the center, there is that horseshoe shape. And the horseshoe shape represents the Urwan or our soul. And the purpose of our soul is to evolve, to progress. So the Farohar figure has been given wings to help it soar. The wings in detail have five layers of feathers. They're often ascribed by some as to the stages of evolution of the soul. Incidentally, 
the five days also allude to these five stages of evolution of our soul. And then to help the soul balance itself, it's got two hooks on either side. They represent the two forces that act on our mind. The good force, spenta mainu, and the evil force, angra mainu. And because our mind is torn apart by the struggle of these two forces, to stabilize our soul, there is this tale of three layers, which depict the teachings of Umata, Huvarashta, Umata, Hukta, and Huvarashta. Good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. Looking at the top, the figure has a human head, and this represents that our Mazda has given us a free will, a mind, a mind that we can choose to obey or disobey the universal laws. If the soul exercises its free will and chooses to follow the right path and balance itself on its tail between the forces in the tug of war, then our soul can make spiritual progress along the path of Asha. The Faroar figure has a ring or a circle in the left hand. The ring denotes eternal time and the soul came from God and will return to be with God. And the raised right hand indicates that it is in our, our hands to make our destiny. We reap what we sow. However, we live our life in this physical world. That's how we'll earn either the reward or the punishment in the spiritual world. Thank you. Thank you, Karam. Uh, do we have any questions? Pedos, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Adhagraf. Hey, Kayomar's wonderful presentation. Thank you. I am hey, so I'll glad. One thing, this is the meta I like more than the other one, huh? <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. We all metas are equally unlike. Don't go. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, please. Uh, I have a question and it is really, I'm not trying to create any controversy or anything. In fact, I'm trying to figure out a solution. When you mentioned that Fravashi in the group three uh, are the ones who come on their own volition during the Hamaspat Maidem Ambar days, then how do we understand, and this has been discussed with some of my friends who were mobeds uh, in Houston, what calendar do they come during that time? Do they come with the Kasli calendar, Hamaspat Mai? Do they come Sensai calendar? When do they really come? And I think a compromise solution is that I think, what does it matter the, if the Fravashis were Sensai? Let them come at the Sensai, Hamaspat Mai. If they, they were Kadmi, let them come at the Everybody can be happy instead of getting hung up with the controversy of when and why not, etc. That's one thought. And the other suggestion I want to make, not that I'm trying to correct you or anybody else, but this was beaten into my head by Dastuji Nauruz Minocharamji, uh, Ardavira's uncle uh, from the Fasli Agari who had come to us in Edmonton and saw that first time in our Edmonton Association or Anjuman's letterhead. And he says, would you please consider reprinting this letterhead with a correction where he said that who mata, hukta, who varsta is not correct. Who mata, huta, hukta, and vrashta. There is no you in the who varsta. That's the sound, the Western word is vrashta. So that is just a suggestion. I don't think we need, because even today, many classes 
many children. It kind of sounds rhyming and it becomes Parsi Gujarati to Humatahuk Avrasta. But let's stick to the correct word as Vrashta, if you can. Just a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, like you said, it doesn't matter to determine when those 10 days are. Uh, realizing that whenever we offer our prayers, we also invoke all the prophecies. So maybe the ones that are not correct, not technically correct, we are still offering the prayers and therefore we invoke them and invite them to come. So to me, that satisfies the argument. Wonderful. Good diplomatic answer. Kayomars, may I ask a question? Sure. This is more from a practical standpoint and maybe a dumb question. So our community, the Zoroastrian community, is being blessed by Dada Oram as the because we have some of the smartest people, men and women, and in fact, women more educated than men. But when we go to our association meetings, we see so much discord. Uh, and it's hard to understand where that is coming from. What do you think between the three is missing? Your Pravashi, the Bodongo, are they miss are we missing the step up transformer or we are totally missing it? What is it that causes it? And how do we change it from a practical standpoint? I think it's a very important question. And uh, I just off the top of my mind, I think that there is a lack of the fundamental understanding of our religion. Most of our people are taught good thoughts, good words, and good deeds, and that is the religion. And that is, but they don't understand the depth behind those concepts. And then each one has a superficial idea of what it is. And in my mind, if our children, right from the beginning, are taught our prayers, which they are, but also the meanings of the prayers, what do they stand for? Then systematically they get the whole picture of what our religion, how it views everything. And whenever they pray, if they understand the meaning, or even us, why children, adults, if we understand what we are praying, each time we perform our kasti prayer, then automatically it'll instill in us this principles that um, first of all, we all have a picture of Zarthustra hanging everywhere in possibly all our rooms, wherever we want. But it's more important to have it in our heart, in our mind, and, and then understand all his teachings. And, and they are they are very vast, but at least we make an attempt to understand the basics. And I think that will lead to at least common thinking. And then of course, with the free will that everybody has, we still won't be able to assure 100% unity, but maybe there would be some concerted effort towards a common understanding. That's my thinking. And towards that effort, I'm glad that NAMC has started a course on understanding the prayers. To me, that's very important. In my own efforts, the classes that I have conducted on the internet have stressed that they offer detailed meanings of each prayer. Not only just word to word meaning, but what do they imply in actual daily life? And that, once somebody understands that, then that should help them to focus properly. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from anyone? No? Yeah. Sorry, Posi, Posi, Posi Mehta, please. Uh, if, you, if somebody can explain to me if my understanding is right that when we before we are born, the Pravasi decides uh, what 
help what what are the experiences that we need in this life and that is how our birth is conceived uh, i don't know if i'm explaining this right or not but if someone can help me clarify that the the way that um, i understand is and i haven't gone into that detail but when we are born the pravashi is assigned to us now what mechanism goes into assigning that pravashi the pravashi is the same that is in you and in me and in everyone else it's the same um same compendium of all the universal laws all the knowledge everything so this is just when we talk about our individual pravashi we lose sight that the pravashi is is god the, the entire we just have a part of god a spark of god within us so, but we but that spark of god has the same access to the universal of knowledge as anybody else that has this pravashi so i don't i don't necessarily have an answer for you in your understanding that it is a, it is tailored i i haven't seen it anywhere mentioned that the pravashi is tailored to what we are supposed to be doing or etc i think freddy and katie has their hands raised go ahead freddy yeah uh, thank you uh, thank you adam enough thank you very much excellent presentation uh, first is a request and question would this be available on the nmc website this presentation is powerpoint because we can certainly use it in our religion class in zadaso over here absolutely yes uh, i would appreciate that yes yes and secondly i had a humongous book that i got from my uh, son's mother in law uh, sori bamji's wife and this is a book of excavations in iran area and all that assyria and all that in that book the iconic representation of such a zoroastrian religion with this pravashi uh, is kind of adapted by i guess it could be after we were in egypt in the achaemenid era but this is a pre first persian empire uh, carvings in the in the caves during the namuchit nazir time where you see figure heads of human beings with four wings and half human half wind angels etc so i think it's a pre uh, uh, persian empire uh, concept that was brought into and it's now of course we it's not our own zoroastrian representation but it's a question have you come across this kind of a uh, uh, line of thinking in your research that it's not really something that has been there forever it was something that we have adapted from the assyrian uh, symbolic representation or something like that i i don't uh, i haven't come to be very specific i haven't come across that kind of depiction but the uh, farohar figure is an adoption from the ancient times and it has evolved sometimes it is even without the human head just the uh, the lower part right so yes it's a, it's an evolution and bear in mind that it's a symbol it's just something that we have adapted over a period of time and uh, this has this particular adaptation has stayed there is a, also a controversy should it be facing right or should yeah. it be facing left and this and that but uh, it's just a figure and the Absolutely. important thing is to understand the philosophy behind thank you thank you very much excellent presentation thank you thank you any other question or comment no hey uh, thomas thanks again maria maria maria, maria 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 i'm maria. sorry i didn't see the hand yeah that's okay oh, sorry about that maria and also and kushru and kushru also sorry i need better glasses <laughs> and geeta uh, i want to 
uh, just going to expand on what uh, Freddie was saying, Mirza. And he's right, it's pre Zarathustra, it's actually Assyrian. When the Medes, who separated from East Iran and settled in media, and then they conquered Assyria, they borrowed all these icons from the Assyrians. When Cyrus the Great conquered uh, media and made it part, part of the Achaemenid Empire, they brought it to Iran. And that's when uh, uh, Darius, the, Darius the Great, the, uh, King Darius, he actually put that pharaoh with a modification. He put all these um, heads and hands and rings and all that uh, because the Assyrian symbol lacked all that, didn't have that. That was added on post Zarathustra by the Achaemenid kings. And that's why we see that on the uh, Nakshirustam in other places, and that comes from there. So it's actually, it is really pre Zarathustra, and it's Assyrian, not Egyptian. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Sure. Welcome. Ushru and then Gita. Ushru, you have to unmute you. yourself. Yeah, I did that. Thank you very much. There's, there was a question raised about the Fravashi choosing the person to, born, to be born with. Um, rather than that, I would think that the Fravashi just notes that there's something, somebody is born and will need a Fravashi to guide. It's not because the Fravashi chose this person to be born and to be helping this person or that, that doesn't come in. The Fravashi is ever present. It's omnipresent anyway. And so when there is a person that's born, that person needs the guide and the guide is ever present. Or Ramazda is ever present. Um, I don't think there is a picking and choosing. Oh, I don't like this guy. I'm going to be born with the other one. No, it doesn't happen like that. It's just there all the time. That's, that's my uh, understanding of it. And also the about the symbol. We were at the Tokkapa Palace in Turkey. And outside the library door is this symbol without the human torso. It's just the winged circle. And so the symbol has been around for a very, very long time. That was my two bits worth. Thank you. Thank you. Gita? Hi, thank you so much uh, for, for an excellent presentation. Obviously raises a lot of questions that would not be appropriate to sp speak today. But, but I do have one quick question. Now, this picture of Zartorsh has been in my house, my family, since I was born, you know. My, my grandmother had it, and my grand grandmother had it, and my parents had it. I have it. So one day, my, my kids, uh, that they were born in the United States, they said, Mom, what's a picture of this? Is this like some sort of a Jesus Christ with a finger going up in the sky, like, a world, that's a sky, and we're not, nothing about the body and the soul and the farashi and all of this is just this body that we can relate it to ourselves. We don't know how Zatosh looks like. I mean, I hope it looks like better than having a finger up uh, pointing to the sky. But what is the purpose of having that picture in our house? I understand the, 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 the lessons that we need to learn, but what about the picture? Thank you. Good question, Gita. The, the picture is there to remind us of our prophet. So the way that we explain to our children who have questions is that the picture is there to remind us that there was a prophet and that prophet has given us our religion. And the one finger is the important characteristic of our religion that we believe in one supreme God, Aura Mazda. And before Zarathustra's time, that was not a common belief. We, Zoroastrian religion, is the first religion to believe in one supreme God. And then from our religion, that belief perpetuated into Judaism, then went into Christianity and into Islam, where all of these religions now 
believe in one God. And like I said, it is not important to have the picture of Zarathustra hanging somewhere, but it's more important to etch that picture in our heart, in our mind, so that we become knowledgeable that we have a prophet that has given us our religion and that then would encourage us to learn about our religion. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, excellent. Any other question, Carmen? So, so Freddie, uh, I'll just add one thing very quickly. Um, so Dastuti Minotaramji used to come to our home every week because he used to give classes uh, in, in the school uh, near in Parsi colony. And when I was younger, it's difficult to explain the concept of Ravashi, soul, Mahodanga. I mean, I didn't even know that word, okay, when I was a young kid. And he told me something simple, maybe kind of dumbed down, so to speak. And he told me one thing which I tried to follow in my life. And he said, in your life, uh, do no harm, just like the doctors, okay? And he said, most of us are not going to become like Mother Teresa. So try and do only one good deed in your life every day. And if you start that from your Naujur day, when you're seven years old until you die, then you've done thousands of good deeds. So that's the thing I try to live by. If I can't do anything good for my community, shut up and be quiet. That's what I try to do. Anyways, thanks a million. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, Fridosh, I see your hand up. You want to say something? Unmute, unmute, Karo, please. Sorry about that. Just to complete this concept that Kayamarsh was trying to explain about uh, the understanding of our prayers and scriptural words. I have always wondered if I spoke to you just now in Cyrillic or Swahili, what communications would I make? Zero. So why is it that we insist on talking to Aura Mazda to our prayers? He, can, he or she can understand every language, but we don't understand the language we are talking to Aura Mazda. So that is really a one-sided communication that really doesn't mean anything. So I have spent all my life purchased many, many copies of the Kangaji's translation of Cordia Vesta Gathas from the Panchayat office in Bombay. Every time I went to India, I brought 10 copies for my young class students and gave them out because I. this is what NAMC can do. Ensure so that... Setting. Yeah, let's, I think please let me finish my please let me finish my thought. Sorry. Otherwise, you go ahead. There is no point. No, no, no. I, I'm saying I, I think you should we should have remember we have a discussion group, and that is one of the things that we want to have in a discussion group. It's very important, your topic. I, I am sorry. What I am trying to say is that NAMC can help make sure if they can, I'm not forcing anybody, that every Darthosti household should have a copy of Hordia Vesta and the Gathas in a language they can understand. Otherwise, you don't know what that, but you're praying anyways. And luckily, now I am saving a lot of money by not buying those books from Parsi Panchayat because everything now, even the Hordia Vesta Kangaji's translation is on the internet for free. It is just that you need to introduce that to our people I do it mostly through the children's classes and some adult classes, and it's an excellent sort of avenue that NAMC can choose. Thank you. So, Fridosh, we agree with you totally, but I think, uh, so if you see what Kempton has done over the past few months, is first, I think we have a bigger problem. Most of our kids are not praying, uh, period. Um, so, you are at the second level, uh, we are trying to get people involved at the very first level, make sure people begin to say their prayers, understand the meaning of our Kusti prayers, how to do Kusti if they've forgotten it. And once I believe, okay, if people begin to pray, then they're more likely to look at the meaning of prayers. It's unlikely that somebody just goes and starts to read the meaning of prayers. So we totally agree with you. And we even wanted to have a discussion about what language our younger generation should pray. If they don't want to say the Avasta prayers, what should they say their prayers? And so that is a big discussion that we want to have. No, I don't want you to drop Avesta. 
please don't mm-hmm. misunderstand me we, i we, want we the children and, and i want everybody to that. pray in the language as it is written in avesta or pallavi but understand what they are doing i have a complete english translation of the kasti or sudhe pushi prayers complete english kem namaza and everything and i get my class children to do that with the demonstration of the kasti when do you snap that when do you make the circles in the english version now that they understand then they can pray in avesta or whatever which is more important to me but i want them to pray in avesta but understand what they are doing that's why i am doing this english part because that's a language that is common to all of us Thank we you. agree any other questions or comments no hey kayamars thanks a million and please keep up the good work thanks Thank a lot again thank you thank everybody. you kayamars love to wish everybody a happy nowruz